Hello, everyone. Uh, this is a special demo preview of some functionality that uh, we've been working out. When I say we, I mean Greg, um, and I am the cheerleader for this. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Greg in a second, but I want to give you everybody some context about what we're doing. Um, this is related to the Kubernetes work we've been doing in general. Um, this was some work, uh, CNCF, uh, collaborative slash sponsored work um, to do a digital rebar Kubernetes integration. And there's a whole presentation about this. Um, I'll throw the link into the, the notes uh, so you can read it yourself. So I'm, I'm not gonna go through all the details, but the idea is we're trying to, to really create a minimal bare metal bootstrap Kubernetes integration, right? With rebar, with infrastructure as a service, Kubernetes and infrastructure, very, very straightforward stuff. And the goal has always been to create a closed loop system. If you've seen our crib videos, which I strongly recommend you do, because we're not going to go into how any of that works. We're going to jump into the next phase. Then, um, then you've already seen the, the one direction. This video is about the other direction, closing the loop where Kubernetes controls the IaaS system. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of pieces and parts that have to work with that. But this is the idea we want. We've shown you how digital rebar sets up Kubernetes. Now we're going to show you the other direction. Um, and with that, Greg, that was my preamble. Not even two minutes. See, not so bad. Sure, we'll go with that. <laughs> it was slides. Greg, give them something. Give them some meat. Start with, with real stuff. Okay. And introduce yourself first, please. Yeah. Uh, let me, where'd it go? I'm Greg Althaus. I'm CTO and co-founder here at RackN. And I'm trying to find my share button. Here's my share button. All right, so there we are. So what have I got? Um, I've got a Kubernetes cluster. We used crib to set this up. And as you can see, it's got its normal crib results profile. So here's all of our normal Kubatom tokens and stuff like that. The master's elected and our SCD cluster, all that normal crib stuff. But well, instead of using crib to add our worker nodes, I have worked on and created a fork that I'll work with them to get back um, of the Kubernetes machine controller. This is a um, piece of software that adds to the Kubernetes clusters itself that uses the, what is it, the cluster API SIGs, um, API definitions to allow you to extend and uh, grow and shrink and add to the Kubernetes clusters by managing machines. So I've already kind of set up an initial deployment that created three machines. And so that's what's running over here. Normally, the machine controller is deployed as a pod deployment into Kubernetes itself. But because I'm running a custom machine controller, I'm kind of running it right now outside. But it would run as a container that could run within Kubernetes to manage the size of the cluster as needed. And so in this case, um, I have my three machines. And if I look, I can see, hey, look, there's nodes. And there's all of my nodes running. But there's a new piece called the machine. And the machine tells you like what OS, what provider. In our case, we've extended machine controller to have a DRP provider. And so the machine is managed that way. To make this work, you have a new construct called a machine deployment. And looking at the SIG cluster, you can get all sorts of additional information. In this case, I define a machine deployment and it has some definitions for what I want a machine to look like. In this case, I want to use the DRP cloud provider. That just means use DRP to give you bug metal machines. And then running kubelet 1.12.3, you know, which matches what we have in crib. And then we tell it the CentOS operating system. We also need to tell it various information about what cluster or what DRP to use and endpoint and stuff like that. Um, we're setting this up to use the pooling plugin. Right now we're just directly creating machines in our one of our, uh, using our packet IPMI system to create machines, but eventually the pooling plugin will take over for that. 
And so it uses secrets as well. So in this case, we use our secrets to define our token and our endpoint. That way our deployment doesn't have it and we can restrict access. And then it allows us to specify some other parameters for driving that DRP cloud provider. So in this case, um, I already have my three running. If I want to reduce the size of the cluster, I can tell it, no, I only want one machine running. And then I can um, apply that deployment. And then if I see over here, this goes a little more busy. And as I'm running, I can see it deleted the machines out of digital rebar. And uh, eventually with the pool plugin, it'll put it back into the pool and we'll be able to drive the machines that way. And it's removed them from uh, packet. And if I go look at my machine, I can see now we only have one machine available and nodes has shrunk. Now the nicety of when you remove the machines, it goes through the process of actually draining, moving workloads, all of those things, making it not schedulable, then pulling, pulling the machines out of the cluster and then telling Digital Rebar Provision to remove the machines and return them to the pool or delete them. So, so that's all of the clustering behavior that you would expect, sort of Bosch-like behavior, but this yeah. is for Kubernetes where it's correctly adding, removing, um, draining. That's a, lot of, that's a lot of good cluster behavior that, that they're writing generically right for any cluster, uh, Amazon, right. Microsoft, We've Google, whatever. It to work with the bare metal machines, and in this case, the system. Uh, right, but destroying machines is easy. You're about to show us creating machines. Yeah, so I changed my replica account to 10, and then I reapply my machine deployment, and my phone's ringing. But that's okay. And you can see it starts running and, and wait and generating machines and machine requests. Ugh. And I can see the system has now created the machines actually nine new machines. It already knew it had one running, so it left that one running. And added nine more machines that are in the process of being created. Um, Packet is assigning those machines, creating them, and then we're going to, um, in our case, we're going to deploy Sledgehammer. The nicety is we've taken away the, what you want it to be. So the machine controller plugin, or, um, service within Kubernetes basically says, deploy me CentOS, deploy me CoreOS, or Ubuntu as my backing operating system. With our system, we allow you to specify what stage you want them to run through, and then run those through, and then it'll join it to the system. So you could fake out the system so that it didn't necessarily install a CentOS system, but we've tried to make that this in line. The nicety with the workflows that we're doing is we're actually letting you do things like choose between live installs versus persistent installs and things like that. So in my demo here, I'm actually running inside of Sledgehammer in uh, our discovery image running CentOS 7.6 um, without actually having to do a full install. So it's actually not directly installing the stuff onto the disk and rebooting. It's actually running out of an in-memory version of the system. So, and that lets us then take advantage of per site customizations. If you needed to install Docker or special repo or, or anything was unique, then the, this, that allows the flexibility of the operator to handle that without breaking the cluster behavior. That's right. From, the, from that behavior. That's a big, that's a really big deal. And it's subtle. It, if you've seen the way we use digital rebar, um, hopefully you'll go and look at some of these other things that workflows are very powerful and they're designed for people to match their infrastructure to a, to a workflow. Uh, and this allows you to do that without breaking generic function that works on any cloud. Yeah. So here's our nine nodes. They've booted up in packet. They're running. They booted Sledgehammer and they've gotten to the point where they now need to do the machine controller piece. In this system, we've extended digital rebar provision to basically let your images run as if they were in Amazon using cloud inits. And so part of what the machine controller does is it assumes it has a way to, to issue a cloud init. And so we're running the machine controller's cloud init on its behalf starting that service. And then as that service runs to completion, 
those nodes will actually start to show up inside this system. And so let's see, we have any that are finished. None are quite finished yet. So they're still in the process of, they've got CloudInit installed and we started running them now. And, running. and most of the Kubernetes install is done through that, that CloudInit file, right? This that's is right. different so, than crib workflows. That's right. So we left, so machine controller wishes to have its own CloudInit kind of bring up process. That's fine, their choice. So we left that. We could have done all this stuff to kind of pre-stage it and then do just a, like a kubatom join or something. That's not their philosophy using the machine controller. So we chose to maintain their, their install path and add the ability generically to just run an arbitrary cloud in it. Um, this allows it to match their kind of assumptions about what the cloud's going to look like. With that said, there's some changes that we've made to their cloud init structures. So for example, if you already had Docker installed, then it would skip that process in their cloud init. This allows you to do things like install Docker from a local repo or take advantage of a in-memory system where you mount the disk locally. Their cloud init doesn't necessarily understand that, but you could pre-stage that inside of the system. Makes a lot of sense. And so, so and cloud init's a generic function functionality. So any any cloud init process, we we now have a stage for. That's right. So um, as you can see, our workflows are finished. We said they're complete. We've turned that back over to digital to the machine controller, and it's it's waiting for the nodes to get truly ready. Once the nodes become truly ready, then um, it kind of goes back to an idle state. It's sitting there watching various components so that it can rebuild them as needed. So, so I mean, Kubernetes like monitor systems and, and track stuff, it has a tendency to keep things running if, if they tip over. Does that translate over here too? That does. Yeah. Um, and so, um, if I delete a machine out from under it, so that delete command is actually going in, removing the machine from the pool, or from in this case, it's deleting the backing machine. It's it's gone. The machine is gone. Now, eventually, Kubernetes will detect it's not ready and attempt to rebuild it. But that may take a little while, depending on how long it's storage and all that other stuff. Um, so we'll see what happens, but it, it should handle making sure that gets eventually retried as it could have been factor. There it goes. So it noticed that its machine went away that was supposed to be handling that. So it's bringing it back. Right. So this is effectively a forced pool refresh, uh, right. from the, from the infrastructure side. Correct. So if the machine goes away and is permanently gone or I mean is gone and needs to come back, the system will try to redraw that machine from the pool. And there's some questions about the side effect of that with regard to things like is that really what we want? Um, if it's a physical machine. Uh, in this case, if I delete it from DRP, uh, the assumption is I actually don't have that machine anymore or I want that machine to go through a new discovery process and become something else. So then this would draw from the pool and recreate that machine from the pool. The names are based upon what the machine controller selects. Makes yeah. sense. But at the same time, if you know, it would make sense. Kubernetes was likely the master here and you'd ramp things up or down and let the pooling behavior do what it's supposed to do. That's right. It looks like the, looks like on the back end one of the servers failed to provision based on emails I'm getting from Packet. Yeah, that was a previous one, and so that allowed us to also just delete that machine and then continue. So that way, when failures occur, like in our cloud instance in this case, Packet, then we can just continue on and, and make progress anyway. Oh, that's pretty awesome. Okay, so this insulates us from provider failures from host host provide hosting provider failures too. Potentially, yes. From that perspective. That's cool. And then with pooling, uh, the pooling behavior, it would be even faster because you'd literally just be moving machines in and out of the pool and just it's a pooling's more of a workflow reset than it is a uh, 
Yeah, with the pools, you could then choose all sorts of things to do, right? You could um, choose to have machines on hot standbys. You could have them, right, choose and then make make actions based upon that pool. And oh, they, they do things like replenish pool and all that kind of stuff. So you could have a pool of machines that already had all the prereqs installed and then it would just be the cloud init stage would take over. So just built, adding it to a cluster would be the last step. Everything else you would literally just have it ready to go. That's right. And with DRP, the fact that um, we're allocating and controlling the path of the machine, um, you could have a pool of machines that might be 30 machines and then have different machine controllers pulling from the same pool and then they could go to different clusters. Right. Or you could have the same pool or, or separate pools per cluster. The point is, while I'm showing one cluster here, DRP could be actually managing multiple DRP clusters or multiple Kubernetes clusters with the same DRP instance using pools to restrict how many machines are available for each Kubernetes cluster and things like that. So then that, that would be like a, you could do a CI CD or if you had an environment where you were spinning up a lot of, spinning up or collapsing a lot of clusters, you, would, you could literally bring up a cluster, give it the keys, tell it to expand itself, contract itself and disappear. And then all that would be handled through the pooling and then the machines would automatically recover, be cleaned up and then put back in. Or if they're in memory, that's, there's really just no cleanup at all. You just uh, K exec back to sledgehammer and wait, right? Correct. Wow. So recycle yeah, 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 times could exactly. be seconds from that perspective. That's right. Depending on what, how you, how much and what you need to do. That's right. Or you could decommission through a full wipe workflow if you needed to. As well, right? Makes a lot of sense. And you'd have visibility in it because right, the machines aren't really being destroyed. So in, in digital rebar, you'd watch them go through the pool process, yeah, in, our, and that's a whole do, another video people should go watch if they want to see how the pooling plugin works. I mean, our whole event system's still running, right? I mean, all that's still being done, generated, so you're watching it go through all the sequences. That's cool. Right. You can yeah. even do the same thing with, with tenants, and then we could pool assigned to a tenant and then move on, and then uh, restore. There's a lot. I mean, this this is the, the pooling step is is going to add in a lot of a lot of extra functionality when we do that next step. This is sort of the first pass, but powerful, very powerful. That's right. But see, it's already rebuilt and, and rehealed the cluster in some regards, right? Because we we had killed G X X C two, and it's already back and ready. And and if I'm if I recall with the the cluster API and the machine controller pieces, the goal here is that you would could do a rolling upgrade, and use these control points as your orchestration model. And so that's actually being done in community. Uh, all that behavior that would work in any cloud, we've just extended it with the machine controller to work in bare metal. Yeah. Right. So you can do it rolling. Part of upgrade. the machine deployment. So I could actually say down here in theory, though we don't have it, I could. I don't want to do this, but in, supposedly according to the cluster API, I could change the kubelet version, right? And then leave my replicas and let the rolling updates go, and it would do one at a time, updating it to the next version. So you get Kubernetes behavior. And you could do the same, you could do this for things besides Kubernetes, you just wouldn't have the cluster API. So the machine controller could be used as your corporate um, or team machine assignment. You could say, well, if you need a machine, go to the Kubernetes cluster and allocate it to yourself. Um, and yeah, if I mean, you started a different workflow, you could, you know, that you could use that as the, as your pooling interface. Maybe a little wonky. Possibly. I mean, you have to think you have to really like Kubernetes. Well, and, and you'd have to be willing to deal with the Kubernetes RBAC stuff, right? Right. So if you've already embraced that, then that's probably okay. Anyway, I like it. Been playing with. That is a very, very big deal. It, it to me, it, it's this closed loop idea with Kubernetes, um, where we're showing, hey, yeah, we set it up, but then we're actually able to do the reverse control and let Kubernetes introspect the infrastructure the other direction. So cool. Thank you. That's a powerful demo. No problem. <laughs>